The next lecturer is Sue Gentry from RMIT Melbourne. And it's a pleasure to have Sue here the second time. Sue is an academic and has a PhD in the interior architecture and she's also been leading the course of PhD studies in RMIT. Now I think that we could hear some more philosophical approach. So, Susie, so very welcome. I'm just a little bit nervous about my images because it's such a big screen. So I hope the resolution is all right and that they don't look a bit too um, pixelated. But the first one may look a little pixelated because it's come all the way from Australia. So <laughs> it's not funny. What's funny about Australia? It's further than India. Yeah, it's further than India. <laughs> So yes, to bring academics and practitioners together, I think it's a very interesting experiment in itself, because often there is a bit of a disjunction between, between the different kinds of conversations and interests as well. And I think that what it then opens up between them is very, very interesting. And I think it's also critical for the development of the discipline. And when I talk about the discipline of interior architecture, interior design, I mean, within that sits the profession and education. And there's been some very interesting debate around that with the International Federation of Interior Architects, Interior Designers, um, particularly through an, an academic, Ellen Klingenberg, who talks about that we don't have education leading into the profession, but rather that both sit within the discipline and make contributions, which I think is a very important idea to, to keep in mind. And I also appreciate in Estonia um, that interior architecture has a very long history and is a valued profession. In Australia, it's very different. Um, and there's a lot of misunderstanding about what interior design is. And I say the word interior design because um, the term interior architecture is only just starting to be used. And it's been used for some programs in some universities who are calling themselves interior architecture. And apparently that's mainly to get more male students enrolling and applying to do it, and that's not actually working so well. But, um, and it's also just this way of trying to clarify and distinguish themselves from a misunderstanding of interior design in relationship to interior decoration. <clears throat> Which I think in the 21st century um, is not such a bad relationship to have, I think, the problem that we've had with interior decoration and interior design is very much a modernist issue. And that it's timely that we embraced interior decoration as part of what the profession is. So really, anyone in Australia can call themselves an interior designer if they want to. They don't even have to have done any study at all. And um, you can actually only call yourself an interior architect if you've done architecture and you know, you're qualified as an architect. So those students that are doing interior architecture programs cannot call themselves interior architects without being sued. Um, it's a legal issue. So the title of my talk, Interior Designing, it's deliberately designing to focus on practice doing designing, and whether it's in the profession or in the academy. And I think that this critical, this focus on doing is a critical focus. And so we ask questions of how rather than what, rather than saying what is interior design. And my own practice has been positioned in interior designing. 
I've worked you know, in um, corporate interior design for just a little while. And, um, but also as a curator and exhibition designer of museum and um, exhibition designs, as well as writing and editing. I'm also involved in research projects which, um, interesting, interestingly enough, look at urban interior issues, bringing interior design, interior questions into the urban environment. And there's also another project that I'm currently working on, which is looking at the environmental conditions of houses of young people who have been removed from their families because they've been um, sexually abused or suffered neglect and placed into state care. And so, you know, they suffer from trauma and a whole range of kind of concerns. And they're placed into these houses to be looked after, but the houses are actually very institutional and, um, and not conducive to a therapeutic environment. And this student, Kristen, said I'm also an educator and I've been head of interior design at RMIT um, in Melbourne for eight years. And I'm no longer in that position. I'm at, at a dean level position in the school. But all through this time, I've been a passionate advocate for interior design as a 21st century practice. I think the things that interior design is concerned with um, are, and I guess when I'm saying interior design, you can think interior architecture. It's just that I'm used to saying interior design. But I think, think um, interior design's practice is dealing with really important critical issues that we're facing at this point in time. And also I just wanted to warn you now before I launch into the rest of my paper that um, I won't say who, but I've been warned not to be too academic. And it's kind of like, well, what does that mean? I mean, I'm, <laughs> I mean, I'm very nervous now. I've sort of spent all my time rewriting my paper. But um, <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> and you know, I guess the other thing I just want to say is I've never studied architecture. So when people say um, interior design is interior architecture, it's, I, I don't have a relationship to that. I, I don't know what it is to practice architecture. I come from um, a different set of techniques and interests and concerns. Okay. But I guess I am an academic. So it's what I do and that's what I'm going to present. And I see this as a practice as well. I don't see it um, as kind of something theoretical. It's, it's a practice to make ideas. It's a practice to teach. Um, it might not be commercial practice, but I guess in this day, of, day and age of capitalism, everything is a commercial practice. I mean, I couldn't be an academic unless I was making money for someone. Um, a little bit more, probably not myself. Anyway, I'm going to be academic because I really think that the discipline needs to open um, up to different concepts and ideas, and even philosophies, because I, there are ones that dominate, in particular phenomenology and a Cartesian idea, that just sort of are assumptions, that that's what interior is, and ideas of subjectivity and people. And I think um, there's nothing wrong with these ideas, but the problem is that they just remain unquestioned and assumed. and. And designers do not really participate in this kind of engagement of thinking about ideas. However, once one realises that you can open up ideas, then the question of interior and interiority, space and subjectivity become posed and I think what's exciting about it is it's open to creativity, to ways of thinking about how one might work and do with this kind of different boxes of tools. So the opening line of my abstract is that space does not exist and it's intended as a provocation. And I also guess I have questions about this idea of the desire to be comfortable. And that doesn't mean that I want to make people uncomfortable. It's not sort of either or. But I think this idea of always making comfortable, the thing that I'm not comfortable with, com the idea of comfort, is that it has a sense of being settled. And I think that this idea of change, of um, mobility, is part of life. And that the desire to make people comfortable all the time is actually sort of not very healthy for them. Um, this is an image, as I said, from Australia, being in by this special technology that we couldn't get working. And really, it's just a PDF. But um, this is Wagga Wagga. It's um, just on the eastern border of Australia. 
uh, eastern side of Australia, about halfway up. And I took this uh, image when I was installing an exhibition in this place. The exhibition was called A Matter of Time, and it was a collection of um, textile work that was touring around Australia for two years. And this image was always, you know, like I carry images with me, and this image provokes me in thinking about interior designing in relation to the question of inhabitation, of one making habitable, how we occupy, how we inhabit, how we interiorise within exterior. And then, then, therefore, how one occupies and makes space invites consideration of sensibility and of a relation with others. Because this idea of occupying is always going to have an effect on other people. My presentation today is a series of ideas um, directed at key concepts that I see as kind of critical to the discipline. And the visuals I'm going to show you, I'm not going to really be showing you any um, typically interior shots, but rather they're inspirations for thinking and for my thinking. And many of them are from art. And I think this is important to recognise the value of engaging with ideas expressed in art. And the architectural historian Siegfried Siegfried Gideon, in his famous book, Time, Space and Architecture in 1941, wrote a lot about the futurists and various other artists, and he said it was critical that architects, he was writing about architects, looked at the work of artists because they were the laboratories of the future, of things that, that are of um, testing ideas for future work. And plus interior design and architecture have always had a strong relationship with um, art. Now, let's see if this works. There we go. So, to the first proposition regarding the impact of space. The value of provocations are that they open up assumptions that underlie practice. And this idea, this comment, space does not exist, comes from a book called The Ecological Approach to Visual Perception by um, an environmental psychologist, James Gibson. And from his position, he says that the world is composed of surfaces. In interior design, a constant refrain is the idea that interior designers work within existing space. That space exists before the designing, and that it is a container in which interior designers work. What this then often means is that interior designers become translators and interpreters of space, that their designs are then representations of existing meaning. And I think this connects up with the call um, that Turner Christian has made for this symposium. I mean, it's, it's an idea that the past pre-exists somewhere to be represented, represented. And um, perhaps just to add to this, Sashi Khan, who used to be um, a president of the International Federation of Interior Architects Designers, described interior design as a practice of working in void space, negative space. So perhaps you can pick up that just in those couple of comments, there's philosophical issues, obviously, that already inform this idea of practice, that the past is something that can be, that exists to be represented and that space precedes making, that space can somehow be void. In an interesting text titled Space for the Subject, Australian academic Sue Best writes that the demise of space as ge geometry and the rise of space as social, where it becomes a double for the subject, like a canvas upon which the subject expresses and objectifies itself, um, where space sort of becomes a mirror of the subject. She then goes on to discuss how space has become, you know, with this removal of it being foregrounded as geometry to being aestheticized as aesthetics and seen as a product that's marked by the time. And just, just to quote her, she says, in short, space is purged of all the traces of geometry and without the stalling effect of difference take on the status of aesthetic objects, which will, under analysis, in all senses of the world, yield up knowledge about us, our time, our condition. In other words, space is about self-cognizing, self-recognizing. So I think it's kind of interesting, these positions that start to open up, because architecture is often very much associated with the idea of geometry. 
And then this idea of social space, one can think about it in relationship to interior design and interior architecture. Oh, sorry, wrong way. I'm from Australia, remember? <laughs> like upside down. Um, so, you know, just, just, just this thing of opening up the idea of space, and of course this is Villa Savoy reconstructed by, by Le Corbusier. but there's a book you may know um, called Buildings and Words by Adrian Forty, and in, he has different words for um, buildings, um, you know, the, the sort of history of architecture, and there's a very detailed chapter on space that's really worth reading. But he points out that space as a word did really not enter the architectural discourse until the 1890s in Germany. So that in itself is kind of curious and interesting because we just assume that space is space, is architecture, is interior architecture. But it very much became an expression of modernism. And so this becomes a provocation and a problematic. This is a, another Australian philosopher, but she actually lives in the States. And um, I'm interested in her work quite a lot. And she writes this, like, about this idea of um, a certain habit of thought in the sort of relations between space and objects, space and extension, to make it seem as if space preceded objects, when in fact space itself is produced through matter, extension and movement. So I think this idea of sort of thinking of space as something produced through matter, movement, and extension, standing out, rather than the idea of objects being in space, really transforms the idea of what interior designing is too. Because rather than the sort of placement of, you know, from an exhibition, my, my point of view, an exhibition point of view, rather than placing objects in kind of void space, you know, placing something here and something here and something here. This starts to sort of produce craft space, if you like, articulate space. So, as I said, my, my own um, practice is in exhibition design. But what I've done, what, what I do in these exhibitions is it's really experiments. They're sort of one-to-one -one installations that are interested in posing this problematic of interior. And when I talk about interior, I'm talking about not only the white cube space, which is posed as being kind of neutral space and neutral time, but also the person who's looking, you know, this idea that they're an interior as well and looking at an object that is also an interior. So in a museum, you know, an object is seen to be um, something that is like a container that can hold the past, and a viewer is somebody that looks at this and then understands and knows it in space. Um, and I, I think this is something to pose questions to. Um, and through the exhibitions that I do, they become laboratories for thinking about these things and opening up ideas of space, subjects, and objects from the idea that each is already kind of given as an interior to be thinking about interior designing and how one might, might make that. And I guess the other thing that I'm very interested in with exhibitions as well is just how, I mean, it's very standard these days that exhibitions, especially of art, will always have text labels beside the work. And so this idea that you know, when you're looking at a work of art, you need to understand its meaning. And um, because we've sort of lost a lot of visual literacy, people will look at the words to understand what it means. And then with this image, which is from a classic in exhibition design book, it says, well, you've got to hang it at eye level height, you know, like a horizon line. So it's based on this idea of a perspectival kind of view. and. Um, that there's this person who stands there and looks at it, and that this is a way of knowing and encountering art. But, you know, it's a way that's about identifying and recognising um, art, but maybe not so much about encountering it. What 
what I think in terms of coming back, sorry if I'm being too academic here, but to bring it back to interior designing, it's this idea, what it emphasises is a conscious subject. That's what phenomenology relies on, is a conscious subject that's taking in meaning and understanding and processing. And just to, there's been some um, very nice experiments in the history of exhibition design, but not very many, where they've been looking at this idea of the subject who's looking, not, not the work that's been um, installed, but rather the subject. And Herbert Bayer is someone who's quite famous for this idea of going, okay, well, let's make the, the viewer mobile. And so you can see the small platform of, of the viewer and then how this idea that, you know, the work, it's not just one horizon line, but but it's still the big, one big eye that's looking. It's still the, you know, from a perspectival point of view, it's still the stationary, well, not stationary, it's, mo it's a mobile viewer now, but um, this idea of one person looking. And this was just a very nice, from actually my last trip here, um, um, Morton recommended that, because he showed the abstract cabinet. I don't know if you remember Tuna Kristen, but, this is also, this is by Ella Zitsky, and um, it was something that I've admired for a long time. And anyway, he showed actual, um, the reconstruction of it and told me that it was in Hanover. So after I left here, I went to Hanover and um, experienced this reconstruction. And I've, it's quite difficult to photograph, but there's, there's if you just have keep your eye on this image here, the, 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 the painting, and then as you, move through it, this changes, and then you go around the other side. So it goes from a very simple kind of technique, but at that time quite revolutionary in terms of this idea of how the viewer starts to move and produce meaning in terms of what's encountered. But I just want to digress a little bit and go back to Australia. and. Um, Sorry, you can't see that up the top. It's called The Interior. And this is a magazine that our program did in 1991. I, I wasn't involved um, as head at that time. I was still actually studying. But um, it's interesting because this, you know, I think that my concern with interior designing and questioning ideas of space and subject um, and interior and interiority is something to do with also the things that one has to think about in Australia, and that might be, well, it is different, but I think there's some similarities perhaps with Estonia, that I'll leave for you to decide as I talk about them, but it means that it's a different kind of um, idea of space from even social space that Sue Best was talking about, and that it really raises this question of both how space and subjectivity are produced. So with Australia, the centre of Australia is its desert, and it's referred to as the interior. And um, this is a term that's used by colonisers. Um, you know, in, for Africa, the deep dark jungle is called the interior, and also within the middle of Australia, it was also referred to by the colonisers as the interior. Unfortunately, the guy who started at this magazine up was the new head of the program who came from the UK and um, he came up with the term inter the interior, wasn't aware that in fact, um, you know, the, the British that had come out before him 200 years ago had used it as a kind of colonising term um, for what they were doing in Australia, but um, it's the way life is. So, I mean, this is just a shot of the interior and um, when the British arrived in 1788, they referred to Australia as terra nullius, that it didn't belong to anyone, that it was no, no one's land. And it was, you know, partly this idea because the Aboriginal population um, move around, but also because there's not a lot of um, artifact that is produced and there's no written laws. Just to give you a sense of um, 
this, this is, I kept this small so it didn't get pixelated, but I mean, in the middle is, is the map of the UK and then Australia around that. So that gives you a sense of the enormous space that there is, that living in Australia, one has this sense of, of vastness. But also, um, this is another shot of a, of a beautiful lake called Lake Eyre, which is sort of towards the middle of Australia, but a little bit south. And it's an extraordinary place because you don't have really ever a horizon line. And so there's just this sort of um, spatial sensibility, I think, one of this idea of the interior as something that is, um, from a colonial point of view, is unknown and also um, populated and slightly threatening. And then also this sense of um, space which is undefined by horizon lines, um, like the guy looking at the exhibition design. Ma was seeing with Lake Eyre is that every now and then when it rains very heavily in the north of Australia, water flows very slowly all the way south and slowly fill or fills um, Lake Eyre. And so it becomes almost like this mirror reflection of the sky into the water and then the green starts to grow um, in a beautiful way. This is a shot of a place called Arnhem Land, which is right up in the north of Australia. And um, it's Aboriginal territory. You have to get permission to go in, into Arnhem Land. And I was there curating this exhibition, A Matter of Time, and visiting weavers um, to involve them in, in the exhibition. And this ex experience of being there was quite overwhelming. Um, just the actual surroundings, there was a sense of it being kind of um, full full of sound, full of atmosphere, full of, um, uh, of time. And Aboriginal people talk about being in the land rather than on the land. And so again, there's this kind of shift from, you know, what I was saying about objects in space to things being in, in relation to each other. And, I, you know, like one also feels very self-conscious as being kind of um, coming from generations of, of um, colonizers as well, that realizing that um, you know Anglo-Saxon uh, people within Australia are migrants as well, and um, that you know there's, there's a building kind of uh, conversation and um, aggression around land rights and um, Aboriginal territory. So I think you know there's just a very different. Maybe one of the connections that I was thinking you know is also like with Estonia and just the Russian occupation, very, very different. But there's just this sort of different sense of space that I think that one, a spatial relation that one has. And also just with Aboriginal culture too, time is not linear. They don't have past, present, future, like in Western culture, but rather it's continuous where the past is always present. So this idea of memory is not, not an issue, you know, it's not a question for them. Um, it's kind of, there's a presence. And there's an interesting book on this by a fellow called Tony Swain called No Place for Strangers. And he says that not only did um, the colonizers occupy space, but they also occupied time by introducing Western history and this idea of sort of um, linear time. So just to return to um, my friend here, and I'll check the time. Um, I appreciate that this diagram is very simple and reductive, but I guess my point is that, that the main relation that underpins our sort of thinking around the relationship between people, things, and space, and objects is the idea of reception and communication from one thing to the other. And, you know, in this case, sight's privileged, but it could also be touch or sound or um, hearing. But it's always this idea of a conscious, knowing subject. And, you know, it's kind of interesting with a lot of the medical research that's going on. You know, that consciousness is sort of like 10% of what is actually happening here at this point in time. You know, like, so it's, it's curious just how 
much we focus on this idea of consciousness and, you know, as the kind of as a thing that produces experience too. There's this sort of, and again, this is a philosophical issue that can be opened up. But the idea that somehow the subject produces experience, whereas some philosophers talk about how experience produces the subject. And again, this is kind of interesting for interior designers to think about in relationship to the things that they're doing. It's not just somebody coming to look, you know, at their work and they have to communicate to them. But, you know, they're responsible ethically and um, in a whole range of ways for perhaps the kind of experiences and subjects that they're producing. So this is kind of very different from the idea that space is a backdrop or a container um, for the lives of people. And so um, I just want to pose a, a different way of thinking about um, about people, subjects, objects, space. And um, this is a philosopher that I refer to quite a lot. He's very trendy in Australia. I don't know about here in Estonia, but um, you know, it's a problem when somebody becomes trendy because everybody thinks you're just doing it because you know, you're in a trend. But I mean, I actually find um, that his propositions um, are fantastic for my own creative thinking. And you know, like this quote in particular, because he talks about interior here, and he says the important thing is to understand life, each living individuality, not as form or as a development of form, but as a complex relation between differential velocities, between deceleration and acceleration of particles. So this idea of movement, of, of speed and slowness. So an animal, a thing, is never separable from its relations with the world. The interior is only a selected exterior, and the exterior a projected interior. And so the speeds and slowness of metabolisms, perceptions, actions, and reactions link together to constitute a particular individual in the world. So this kind of is a proposition to be thinking about how we think about the user in a very different way, I think. And um, what it opens up is just, you know, it's not to be thinking about um, this uh, centred subject. And so movement's foregrounded, and most importantly, change is foregrounded. And I guess the proposition is here that movement is always happening. Everything here is moving and changing. And to look at it in that kind of way is very different to look at, at things as fixed and permanent. So I guess what are the implications of this for the issues we're focused on in um, CCU2, and particularly also given the reference here to interior and exterior, and the idea of slowing down. So just a couple of points that were in the CCU symposium um, brief were around personal spatial experience, memory, and the idea, this is quoting Tuna Kristen's um, text, and how do we highlight these memory images? I mean, I think that's quite an interesting proposition, idea of, you know, that memory is a memory image. And um, drawing attention to the user. And also the influence of space on people and people's influence on space. I sort of noticed that um, I've got a couple of versions of the abstract for the symposium. And I noticed that um, in, uh, influence has replaced the word affect. And I'm sort of interested, that's my question at the end for Tuna Christian, is like why, why it's no longer the affect of space on people and people's affect on space. Because the shift to influence is from a shift from affect with an A to effect. Effect is about cause and effect. And it's quite different and that perhaps more measurable in terms of um, outcome than affect. A user is part of a cause and effect um, relationship. But affect is not. And um, affect is quite difficult to understand because it's impersonal. It's about temperature. It's about the body's reaction to things, to space. But it's interesting because, again, in Australia, and I think internationally, you know, like some of the discourse in the interior, there is a lot of interest in affect. And, how as designers we might start to be working with that 
And yet at the same time, you know, it comes back to Pierre's um, point. It's, it's, you know, it's very, you can't measure it. It's not something you can evidence. But there are ways of um, discussing it. And perhaps what it actually really means in the end is transforming the way that designers work and what the role of design is. And I guess, you know, this idea of affect also just refers to the, this is my last philosopher, but Henry Bergson and Deleuze and Gross refer to him quite a lot. He was somebody working in the early 1900s. He was around at the same time as the physicist Einstein. And, um, you know, there's a very nice little story about how Bergson pointed out to Einstein, he's trying to be very polite, but that, you know, he'd actually got things around the wrong way a little bit that um, with his theory of relativity, because he placed space first, that really he needed to be looking at time and how that then creates um, this spatial relation. So I, Einstein immediately uh, rejected it. He was in a conference like this, so he you know, didn't do it to me, I'm a bit of a crank maybe like Bergson, but so Einstein dismissed him and Bergson went out of favor. I mean, he used to be like a celebrity and then he went out of favor for decades. And again, it's interesting, he is coming back in, um, people are very interested because he talks about this idea of that what we tend to do is to spatialize time. You know, we tend to think of it as, you know, linear, like past, present, future, or, you know, like the, this is time moving from point to point, like this. But his, his point, his point is saying that, that we're in time, that already everything is changing and that what happens then is that things then get spatialized from that and from interior designing again I think this is I find this quite exciting because it's thinking well if everything's in movement and changing then the role of the interior designer is not about you know kind of filling space but it's about making space it's about slowing, you know, I think this, this is something that interior design um, does, is it sort of slows things down to make things comfortable for maybe a little while and inhabitable. And then, you know, so that people aren't in this kind of constant flux of, of change, but there's order that's introduced, you know, to use the classic interior design, um, not Vitruvius, he's an architect, but, you know, like from, there's a, what is modern interior design? It was a catalogue that was done for the Museum of Modern Art in the 1940s. And the curator of that said, um, you know, that he defined what is modern interior design, you know, it's harmony, balance, light. And so, I think, you know, I think these ideas are still really important, you know, that it is about um, through the interior designing, you know, if everything is in flux and movement, then it's about slowing things down settling things down, allowing people to inhabit, finding balance, stability, but also, you know, enabling them to kind of continue to move so that they don't become like um, another reference, but Walter Benjamin, the, the writer in the beginning of the late 19th century, and he, well known for writing about the interior, like the bourgeoisie interior, and he says that the collector is, oh, maybe I should show you my slides first. Sorry, it's taking the floor here, but okay. I mean, you know, there's some when there's some very nice kind of ways of just looking at things and thinking about things differently. I like this image of the horse, and you, and when, if you look at the futurists and so on, there's lots of experiments with this idea of that it's not about form and objects, but it's about how things um, kind of and Duchamp, of course, you know, like this experiment with the idea of the movement by body descending a staircase. And this is a girl running on a balcony, a futurist painting. And Umberto uh, Boccioni, Counterlight. And this, this is a little bit um, pixelated, but it's a very beautiful image because what it shows is this kind of shaft of um, sunlight actually kind of piercing through her head. He did a lot of other things where he literally put frames through people's heads and so on kind of integrating the interior into the, the subject, but this is quite a, a, a beautiful work. Um, yeah, I might just have to speed up a little bit, I think. So, I guess just 
this is just a funny couple of slides that I like to show to sort of talk about this kind of conjunction between things and relations, you know, in time. And in the museum studies that I've done, the research, which has been, you know, part of a PhD and so on, I've had this image for a long time because this is from the museum, uh, the British Museum, and at, at its opening in the 1870s. And I saw this kind of extraordinary juxtaposition between this guy and his bowler hat standing beside this um, statue from the Easter Islands, or what they're now called Rapa Nui. And just thinking, well, you know, like, isn't museums are extraordinary places like that, how they bring kind of things from totally different cultures and times into conjunction in the present? And what happens there in terms of this idea of how we make relations with these other cultures, other times. Um, and it's, it's not something that, that one can answer easily. I think it's always kind of an ongoing kind of situation. And um, then, you know, like in 2005, I went to the British Museum for the first time, and I was walking around, and there it is. You know, but this time, it's up on a pedestal, and a really dirty one at that. And um, so I just had to ask somebody, to have my photo taken beside it like I did, um, like the guy with the bowler hat. And, um, and I, sh I showed this to students, and then the student, I had to block her out a little bit, but then when she went to the British Museum, she did it too. So, you know, like but these, these things, it's, it's about actually, you know, this relationship between things that gets made. And um, I think it picks up on some of the things that Per was talking about, about this idea of sort of working in between, working in the middle, making, you know, with the relations that are happening. And I just, you know, I just find museums extraordinary, weird, um, strange, curious places. And I mean, political places and ethical problems as well. But just how, you know, like Western cultures want to gather everything together and to preserve it and conserve it. Um, and so they'll drag in things from Egypt and also, um, you know, the Parthenon marbles. And so people stand there in their backpacks. And for me, you know, this, this, this is, you know, very interesting, this kind of conjunction between um, people looking at these works with their backpacks on and their clothes and what they're wearing. And I guess, you know, this comes back to this idea of what I was talking about, uh, the collector. And um, this is um, there's a very nice photographer, Anne Sahalka, in Australia. And she makes a lot of very, very interesting photographs of um, people in different environments. And so coming back to Walter Benjamin, um, and because he writes about the collector is the true inhabitant of the interior. You know, it was a bourgeoisie interior, the middle class interior. And um, he says that, you know, one has to be careful. I mean, it's about this idea of leading traces, but also one has to be careful because it can be a bit like, become like a spider who brings everything in from the outside and arranges them, you know, and, but they become like corpses, you know, like the, the, the spider is sucked dry of the fly. And, and so, you know, they can't be places that stay fixed there's this idea of having to change and move. So really the desired outcome is not necessarily just to have this space as one's mirror in terms of reflecting the self. 